Good morning. morning. It's certainly a privilege to be here sharing with you this morning. And I just want to say that we, my wife and I, we are your missionaries. We are your missionaries. And the reason is because many of you uh, have supported missions work in Asia and in specific South Korea. And that's where we're from. And South Korea was a land that had no hope, that was devastated, that was invaded by so many countries, that went through a war that tore down everything. But because of the gospel that was planted by your missionaries, by your support, by your prayers, that after a couple of generations, we are here as your missionaries. I think it's 20 years ago, I was in the ripe age of 11, and at the time, I lived in Manchester of England, and that night I was trying to go to bed, and in my bed, I lay down, I closed my eyes, tried to go to sleep, but constantly I had this fear. Something was looking at me. I had this fear. Something was threatening me. So after a while, I went to my parents' room, and I said, Mom and Dad, I can't go to sleep. I'm too scared. My dad, being a preacher, he knew that the moment was ripe. He opened his Bible, and we shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And as he was preaching the gospel to me, as he was sharing the life that Jesus gives, I knew I was desperate for Jesus. I knew without Jesus, I could not be saved. And that night, I received Jesus into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. And that night, I went to bed at peace, with joy, knowing that God loves me. And that's because of your prayers and your support that fed, that lifted a country out of devastation into a land that is sending many missionaries out into the world right now. It is an amazing, it is a surprising work of God that he's doing. And I'm so happy that we are sharing this moment together to share the word of God with you. Today, the text comes from Psalm 51. If you'd like to turn to your Bibles, to Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is found on page 562 in the Pew Bibles. And just as a word of encouragement and a challenge... Um, I would love to see our church and our church members take our Bibles wherever we go, and especially on a Sunday morning to church. Psalm 51. Let me read for you. For the director of music, the Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean, Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. 
Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you have made. We thank you for your son Jesus, the work that he did on the cross for our sins, the blood that washes us clean. We thank you for this time of corporate worship unto you. And as your word is preached, may your glory fall upon this place. Holy Spirit, come, inspire, direct, Correct, rebuke us through your word and encourage us and challenge us to be more like you. Oh God, we love you and I give you all the praise and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Who likes the story of David? Anyone like David? I think we have some Davids in here too, right? David over there, yeah? Who likes the story of David and Goliath? I really like that story. Who likes David becoming the king of Israel? Oh, that's wonderful. Who likes the story of David and Bathsheba? Oh. Well, today's text is talking about David and Bathsheba. But the thing is, people often like to detach themselves from the truth, which is the word of God. Often, we point others to the truth without letting the truth soak into our souls. But today, I want to share with you that this word is for you and for me. We need to have a background. What happened? David was a man after God's own heart. And God loved him. And God blessed him. But pride began to grow in his heart. If you would, there's an account in 2 Samuel that we're going to see, and we're going to study that together today. If you could turn to 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. But put your finger on Psalm 51, because we're going to go back to it. 2 Samuel 11, which is on page 304 in the pew books. Are we all there? Yes, no, or wait. (laughs) All right, we're all there. I'm going to go through this really quickly, so you really have to focus. So beginning from verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. 
Let's stop there for a while. David doesn't go out to war, but it says one evening. In the original text, it means afternoon. So he probably had a sleep in. And then he woke up, he got up, and he, and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And lust came into his heart. He coveted that lady. So what does he do? He calls for her. And then he commits adultery. In order to, in order to cover his sins, what does David do? Well, he tries to have Bathsheba's husband sleep together with them so he could cover up his sin. But that doesn't happen because Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, is a loyal, loyal servant. So in the end, David kills Uriah. Let's skip over a couple of verses to verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Let me ask you a question. Mothers in the house, would you raise your hand? Mothers. We love our mothers. Thank you so much for being loving and kind and being patient with us. How long does it take for a baby to grow and for you to give birth? Nine months. Nine months. And how long did David take to repent from his sins? Because as you look at chapter 12, the Lord sent Nathan to David when he came to him He said, and then there begins a story, a parable that convicts David's heart. So what do you think David did in between those times of after committing adultery, murder, all these prideful sins? What do you think David did in those times? Well, he's a man after God's own heart, so he probably knew what to do rather than be in the presence of the Lord. He probably went through the motions of, I don't know, singing, praising, praying, going to the temple. But it was just going through the motions. How many of you feel like that sometimes? That on a Sunday morning, you know you have to go to church and you dress up, But in the inside, you you don't feel something right. But you still go. And then you come to service. You sing for a while. You pray. You sit and listen to a sermon. And you go home. But you still feel very terrible. Maybe sin is something that's in our lives that is prohibiting us from coming closer and closer to God. So what does Nathan say? Let me read for you, starting from verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him, and his children... It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. 
You are the man. You are the man. Brothers and sisters, it's easy for us to point out others' sins and say, you're a sinner. You cheat, you lie, you lust. But then in our own hearts, don't we have that sin also? Don't we commit those sins in our minds? We offend God. What does sin do? Sin separates us from God. And we never want to be separated with God because he's our loving father. Sin is breaking God's commandment to love God and to love neighbor. And with sin in our lives, we cannot come closer to him. Just like David, maybe our lives are just going through the motions of our daily lives. Okay, we read the Bible. We pray before our meals, sure. And we know how to say holy things. I'll pray for you, brother. I'll pray for you, sister. But maybe in our own lives, we are struggling to find that intimacy with God. And it's a dreadful feeling. But the good thing about our Lord is that when we come to a place of repentance, he does not cast us out, yet he is loving and kind and he is forgiving. When we come to a place of repentance, God forgives us by the blood that Jesus shed on that cross. And that is why we have hope. Because listen, if you were the mother of Bathsheba, how would you feel against David? If you were the parent of Uriah who got killed in cold blood, How would you feel against David? If your brother was Uriah, how would you feel against David? Could you forgive David? But when David comes to repentance before the Lord, the Lord forgives. And some people in this world cannot get over the fact that God forgives our sins. But he does. That is the truth. With repentance, there is forgiveness. And with forgiveness, there is restoration. And with restoration, there is revival. And we want to get to that place today. Let's go back to our main passage in Psalm 51. I read to you the title of this psalm, and it says, For the director of music, a psalm of David when the prophet came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So when the Lord brought the prophet Nathan to David's life, this is where David's character comes out. When his sin is revealed in his heart, what does David do? He repents. And this is the psalm of his repentance. And I pray and hope that this will speak to us today. I see three things that happen in David's life through this psalm of repentance. The first is that repentance restores our personal relationship with God. Our individual relationship with God is restored through repentance. What does David say? In verse 10 to 12, it says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you see God in your lives? If we want to see God, God is calling out for purity and holiness. 
If you feel like there's something blocking your relationship with God, that you cry out to him day and night, but you feel like nothing's happening. Maybe it's because of the sin that is blocking that line of communication. And that is why David probably goes to his knees and cries out this prayer, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. When's the last time you shared your testimony? Because it says here, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. You know, I've been living in the United States for two years, but my English is pretty good, right? (laughs) And many people say to me, oh, here we don't like to offend people. So if they don't like what you're about to say, just don't say it. And if you do offend them, say you're sorry. I didn't mean to offend you. And it's like you can't really even say a statement of faith nowadays because you might offend other people. But the truth of the matter is, if you are certain about your salvation, if you know that God is good and that Jesus reigns in your life, and if you see people who do not know the Lord in desperation, it's going to be natural for you to share about Jesus, isn't it? It has to be like, oh, didn't you know Jesus is our Savior. He died for you. And we would lovingly share the gospel with them. Sometimes you don't even have to say anything. Sometimes you just put a shoulder over their hand over their shoulders and say, God loves you. Let me pray for you. And that's the kind of restoration God is seeking in this generation. Man, I'm learning at school about the great revivals in church history class. And wow, they used to be amazing. I mean, I heard that uh, people would get together and, and pray. And in the churches, they would have meetings and lots of people would come together and, and be saved. And I'm like, well... In the scriptures, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if we believe in the same God, that's still going to happen today if we cry out, if we are repentant, if we seek his face. Amen? Amen. That's what we are praying for. But that begins with you and I. Our personal relationship with God needs to be restored, rekindled. The fire needs to burn again. The passion for his name has to burn again. Verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Wow. You know, as a young Christian, I used to read Psalm 51 and I used to really kind of stop at verse 12. Because I, I love creating me a new heart, that, that part. But I never really read verse 13. But it says, then. So after our relationship has been restored with God, it says, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will turn back to you. Wow. Repentance restores our personal relationship with our neighbors. Repentance restores our relationship with our neighbors. Maybe you have your children who don't believe in Jesus yet. They are your neighbors too. Maybe you have some co-workers that don't know Jesus yet. They are your neighbors. And in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus speaks in Luke about what a real neighbor is. A real neighbor is a person who takes pity, who takes compassion, who has the heart of God and shares the love of Christ to them. It's like that good Samaritan who did not pass that half-dead man, but went to him and served him. With everything he had, he served him. And that begins with repentance. 
that begins with God's grace and mercy alone. The third thing is repentance restores our relationship with the church. Let's read, well, I'll read for you, verse 18. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. This is talking about the church, the church universal. It's praying, interceding for the saints. It's funny because uh, my wife, Pal, and myself, we are going to West Africa, a place called Burkina Faso. Who's heard of that place before? Well, you guys are great because I had never heard of it before until I went into Google Maps. But it's a place that needs the gospel. And they are our neighbors. And there are churches there that need God's word and restoration. And we've been praying. And you know what? God has been miraculous in his provisions. He's prepared a way for us to go and speak to university students. We're going to do open evangelism. We're going to be speaking at about three churches. And it's such a privilege to be able to share this love, this forgiveness I have received with the many people who have never heard of Jesus Christ. And that is why David prays for the church. David intercedes for the church. Repentance, brothers and sisters, does not stop at me restoring my relationship with God. But that is contagious. It overflows to our neighbors, our children, our parents, our neighbors, our nephews. But not only that, it flows to the church universal so that God's kingdom might expand. We must repent of our sins. That's the only way restoration can be found. The good news is that Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for our sins. And he rose from the dead. He ascended on high, and one day he's going to come back. But whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. And Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is why repentance road is the way back to God. Repentance road is our way back to God. It not only restores our personal relationship with God, but our relationship with our neighbors and with the church universal. This is the key to revival, brothers and sisters. Without repentance, there is no revival. I've been studying the revival of South Korea, and in 1907, I've learned that there was a huge revival in the place called Pyongyang. Right now, that's the capital city of North Korea. And that's where they're threatening us to send the boo-boos. All right. Anyways, nonetheless, in Pyongyang, there were a group of people, actually a group of Korean, um, Korean people and also American missionaries that gathered to pray. And as they were praying, the Lord blessed them. Now, this word blessing, I really need to explain to you. In the original Hebrew text, blessing is not talking about material wealth. It's talking about a camel kneeling to let his master get on. Blessing is kneeling. Can we say that together? Blessing is kneeling. Blessing is kneeling. It's kneeling before our Father. It's the posture that David takes when he's praying this psalm. Kneeling before God. That is blessing. And from that, as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you, saith the Lord. 
And in Pyongyang, these group of people began to pray and they experienced God's blessing. They began to, to pray. They began to confess their sins to each other. And you know what happened? Then more people came. They began to pray. They began to learn the word. And they went out to their societies, to their local neighbors. And they began to say, hey, David, I'm so sorry. I cheated on you a couple of weeks ago. And the Lord has put it on my heart to get this right with you. So I confess that. And you know what David did? The non-believer, he's like, wow, this Christian guy, he's really honest. Maybe I should go to church. So David comes to church. And this happened. It blew up. See, it all begins with that one person's repentance. And then it expands to our neighbors. And then the church of God grows exponentially. Wow! I would love to see that happen here. And I'm praying for that to happen here. Every night we pray for revival in this region of New England. And I pray that you're praying that too. Amen? Amen. One last thing I want to share with you today is that Psalm 51 is a prayer. Psalm 51 is a prayer of David in repentance to God. But how did this come about? When Nathan came to David and spoke truth into his life. His heart was convicted and he went on his knees and he repented to God. As you are hearing the word of God right now, the Holy Spirit will convict your hearts of sins. The next step we must take is to pray is to pray and ask the Lord for forgiveness, for purity and holiness. I don't know how you pray. In Korea, when a church gathers to pray, it's very exciting. It's like, okay, guys, we're going to pray now. And then every, everyone says, Jesus, three times. We call out Jesus. Jesus! 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 And then we begin to pray. It's like... I don't know. You need to come to Korea. (laughs) I can't explain it to you. We pray out loud, and it's like a harmonious sound of angels singing to the heavens, reaching out to him. But it doesn't matter the way you pray. You can pray quietly. You can pray out loud. But I encourage you, brothers and sisters, if God is convicting you today of your sins, pray Psalm 51. Do not try to use big words. I don't know big words. God, but I do have the word. And this is truth. When you get to that place, I encourage you to cry out to the Lord with the word. And may this be your prayer that God restores that joy of salvation in your lives so that that will overflow to your neighbors that will overflow to the church universal and that is the key to revival one of the one of the things i love about dcn is that i'm hearing stories of people coming together and praying i heard just like last week two guys went to play golf they didn't invite me (laughs) next time hopefully they will but as they were playing golf they got to a green And then they began to pray. Isn't that awesome? And then the people behind them were like shouting, Oi, get off that green, you know. Anyway, they got off the green and they began to pray too. And then I heard stories about some ladies visiting people at hospitals and praying for them. And then we have our prayer nights of engage where we get together and pray. Man, this is exciting. I see God something doing new and he's going to revive us and he's going to revive this local neighborhood and he's going to strengthen the body of Christ in the church universal. And that comes from a place of repentance. So with that said, let's bow our heads.
Let's spend a moment to really ask the Lord what needs to be taken out of my life so that our relationship with him can be restored. Just for a moment, really, spend that time to ask the Lord for clarity of thought and let him minister to you. And as we do that, I believe the Lord will bless us, meaning he will get us to our knees, our physical knees, our knees of our hearts. We will be humbled by him. Let his presence work in you right now as we pray. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, you are good. Oh, Lord, you are good. I pray for an outburst of your blessing in this place, Jesus. The blessing of kneeling before you, kneeling before the Lord, kneeling before our Savior. Oh, Lord, our hearts cry out to you right now. Our hearts cry out to you right now. Our hearts are open to you right now. Oh, Lord, may you rain down your blessing here. And I pray for a true heart of repentance here. A true heart of repentance, oh Lord. Only you can restore. Only you can save. Only you can purify, Lord. Oh, do a mighty thing in this place, Lord. Oh, do a mighty thing in this place, Lord. We pray for your spirit to fall on this place. I believe the Lord is speaking to you right now to kneel before him. To kneel your hearts, to humble yourself before him. Because God hates the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And with that heart of humility, we must come back to God. Repentance road is the way back to God. And we must get back on that road of repentance. Father God, thank you so much for this time. You have spoken. So Father, work in our hearts and our minds so that we may take Repentance Road, the way back to you. In this age of where repentance is not being preached, oh God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would inspire and convict our hearts to take that road of repentance so that we would be restored to you, that we would be restored to our neighbors, that the church universal will be edified through the power of the Holy Spirit. Break, shatter the strongholds of the evil one, and, O Lord, rain down your blessings upon us to get on our knees to praise you, to worship you. We love you, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, you're doing something amazing in our hearts. It's only you that can do it, God. We thank you. We thank you for your servant, Elisha. We worship you for his obedience to you, God, for putting your word in his heart. Lord, we want to take a moment bless him. I'm going to ask Elisha to come on up front. And uh, Pow, if you come up to uh, Sarah, if you come up to God's going to do something great in their lives as he's doing it among us at this very moment. God has called them uh, to go to a country in a little known country in West Africa that Pow is actually from. And uh, he's joined us. And uh, we want to pray for him. We want to pray for them as uh, we, as their church, are sending them 
to share the gospel with numbers of people. And uh, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity that they have. Um, uh, Elisha's going to be sharing the word, and Pau is going to be translating for him, uh, phrase by phrase. And uh, they have some incredible opportunities that God has opened up the doors uh, to, to be part of. And so uh, we, we need to join together and pray for this team. Let's, uh, let's pray. Let's uh, gather in. Feel free to reach out your hand if you'd like. Jesus, we love you so much and are deeply moved by this incredible opportunity that you have given this team, these servants of yours. Lord, an extension of our body to go halfway around the world to minister to strangers, Lord, but they're not strangers to you. God, we pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that you would empower Elisha, that you would empower Sarah as they proclaim the truth to a lost and broken people. God, would you enable and empower them with supernatural power, power that they cannot conjure up on their own. Jesus, we know that you've called them, and the Holy Spirit, that you have that you have led them and drawn them to this amazing opportunity. And we pray, God, that you would be victorious, that your spirit would convict and draw. We pray, God, that we, as, as the rest of, of their church, could back them, Lord God, not just in our prayers, but, Lord, that we could back them financially as they seek to, to purchase Bibles for the new Christians, the many new Christians that will be, uh, be part of the kingdom of God. Our brothers and sisters, Lord. oh God, we worship you. We anoint Elisha and Sarah and Pau as they go to do what you've called them to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we give you the glory and the honor. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have two ushers that will be at the back doors. Uh, on your way out, any loose cash that's not otherwise designated uh, will go toward their mission trip, uh, toward purchasing these Bibles, as we've mentioned. Uh, also, if you'd like to designate some extra money, you can write a check, make it up to DCN, but in the memo, please make sure it's clearly marked as Elijah, or just say, uh, chose mission trip, and we'll make sure that that money is funneled toward uh, the purchases of those Bibles. God bless you. He loves you so much. As God continues to work in your heart, be open to Him. You are loved. God bless you. Have a great day.